mouse, if you have more mouse. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Let me thank for the organizing committee for the invitation. Uh, everybody knows that uh, back in September there were the new guidelines for cardio on oncology, and I'll try to uh, uh, get some uh, highlights about these guidelines. You know, these gu guidelines are written by uh, uh, the leadership of uh, Alex Leon uh, from uh, Royal Brompton and Teresa from uh, uh, this is La Paz Hospital in Madrid, and uh, it, it's not just European. You see, it is uh, like the Real Madrid team or from all over the world, and there is some uh, people from Australia, from uh, uh, Northern America. Just let me mention uh, the uh, father of cardio-oncology in the U.S., uh, uh, Javed Moslahi, here. And uh, also they included one patient in this uh, uh, guideline writing. So it is a, a multidisciplinary team. And this is the first uh, guidelines for cardio-oncology in Europe and all over the, the world. And it has a lot of definition, prevention, uh, 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 cardiotoxicity definition, and some uh, management. This is the spectrum. There is a lot of things that uh, uh, medication uh, for uh, uh, oncology can cause all those problems. But this we need to understand the risk. And this is a dynamic risk. Look at this. Some patients uh, start with low risk, and this uh, and uh, uh, and this is uh, according to their age and uh, uh, cardiovascular risk factor. And they start low risk, they receive the medication, they go into a little bit higher risk and then return back. And some patients really start with high risk and then receive the medication and goes into much higher risk and then continue on that. During the treatment, they may develop some hits, some infection and increase the risk. So our strategy for cardio-oncology is to start uh, prevention, either primary prevention uh, or uh, secondary prevention as uh, from the start point and during the, uh, the treatment try to monitor the patient and uh, assess whether they develop cardiotoxicity and then at the end of the treatment monitor the patient for this golden first year after treatment and then assess the long-term risk and then control the, uh, uh, the risk factor for long uh, term and according to the likelihood and the severity of the, the uh, cardiac toxicity, we can assess uh, uh, that. So with this cardio-oncology uh, guidelines, there were 272 recommendations. We cannot uh, really uh, <laughs> memorize all of them, but they are divided into four things. That's whether uh, at the beginning of uh, a cancer diagnosis and assessing the risk factor at baseline and then assessing the patient during the cancer treatment and the first year after the end of the treatment and then do the long-term follow-up. So with that, there were some definition for, for the uh, uh, definition of what we call C, uh, TRCD or cancer therapy related cardiac dysfunction, we can divide them with there is, there is obvious heart failure and the patient is symptomatic and there are uh, 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 four types, whether mild, mild, moderate, severe, or very severe, and whether the patient is asymptomatic. And if the disease is asymptomatic, also we can divide them into mild, moderate, and severe. And let's concentrate on this asymptomatic and give more uh, uh, information about that. If that's severe asymptomatic, that means there is reduction in the LV ejection fraction to less than 40%. If it is moderate, that means reduction of the ejection fraction to be between 40 to 49% or at least more than 10% uh, uh, percent, uh, drop. If it's less than 10% drop, it should be associated with reduction in the GLS or elevation in the cardiac markers. The mild thing, there's the ejection fraction continue to be above 50, but there is elevation in the marker, whether it's a, a, a troponin uh, or EMP or a reduction in the GLS. So for the uh, now uh, uh, immune checkpoints inhibitor, there is pathological diagnosis. If there is pathological, pathological diagnosis, it's easy to diagnose that. Just uh, this is the, how the immuno checkpoint inhibitor uh, works, but I'm not going to go through that uh, because we are not immunologists here, so I'll skip that. 
but the diagnosis by, by pathology is so easy. This is the normal heart, and this is the uh, inflamed, inflamed heart. I know I'm not a pathologist, but I can easily recognize the difference, like I'm telling the difference between, between those two, two nice dresses. So now for the clinical diagnosis, if, uh, if we don't need the pathological diagnosis, we need elevation in troponin, plus a major criteria, and this major criteria is the change in cardiac MRR with diagnostic uh, criteria, or two minor criteria, which may, may include ventricular arrhythmia, decline in LV function, two mi minor uh, criteria. But at the, here, we have to rule out acute coronary syndrome, whether due to acute uh, myocardial ischemia, or another infective myocar uh, myocarditis, and in the setting of COVID, there is a lot of infective myocarditis or post-vaccination, so we need to take that into consideration. Now, what's the recommendation to evaluate uh, that? Now, the echocardiogram uh, is the main part, but they recommended that the 3D echocardiogram for better assessment of cardiac function and the GLS. And uh, all of that uh, are type 1 indication, but th there are some indication that especially if the patient receives surgery to the left side or radiation to the left side and the echo is not that helpful, then we may use MRI. And just for the echo, we are not just concentrating on the left ventricle, we need to concentrate also on the right ventricle and they assess the function of the right ventricle. So what's the management? I'm not, uh, there is a lot of uh, things, uh, and we have all the guidelines to treat heart failure, but here with different cancer, we, there is a lot of things that we need to take into consideration. And the main thing is the symptoms and the cancer prognosis, because we know how to treat heart failure, but we, we, when the patient cancer and the survivor is, so, uh, is adva uh, advanced cancer and low survivor, so we need to concentrate on uh, other things. And, Think also what's the alternative treatment and the drug-drug interaction. And there is uh, some uh, uh, good table at the end of this guidelines about drug-drug interaction. And we need to take into consideration a patient preference. And all of that thing can happen in the uh, management of cardiotoxicity due to uh, cancer uh, therapy. But I'm going to go through some of them. And we'll, let's concentrate on the anthracycline. So just here at the top, you see the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic. And in the middle is the decision of the oncologist. If the patient is really very symptomatic and with severe uh, heart failure, definitely we need to stop the medication and probably there is no point to restart this medication. However, if it is moderate, we need to interrupt and then according to MDT, we may restart again. Uh, however, if the patient has mild symptoms, we may, uh, the MDT need to uh, uh, decide whether to continue or interrupt. And for the mild, we need to continue. And at the bottom is the role of the cardiologist. The, the cardiologist can start the heart failure therapy at the beginning if the patient is symptomatic, whether it's mild uh, or severe. And if it's asymptomatic, consideration to start uh, ARB or uh, uh, ACE inhibitor or uh, be uh, be beta blocker. And the same thing for HER2 receptor. Just remember, HER2 receptor has a little bit higher toxicity than anthracycline, and when we combine both of them together, we may increase the cardio uh, toxicity. So it's the same way that we discuss for anthracycline. Just the only thing, because the patient really get benefit from the treatment with S2. If they are asymptomatic and there is moderate, moderate reduction in the LV function, now the recommendation is to continue rather than stop. However, we need to give the heart failure uh, uh, therapy and use uh, ACE inhibitor, ARB, or beta blocker. Now, for the immune checkpoints inhibitor, that's the patient need to be admitted and discontinue the medication definitely and start hard, high dose of methylprednisolone IV for at least three days. And according after that, whether they are recovering or not recovering. If they are recovering, we can switch to oral uh, methylprednisolone 
and reduce the dose slowly. It's just reducing 10 milligrams every week. Reduction of the dose of uh, prednisolone uh, quickly causes a lot of recurrence. So it's slowly, and then uh, adding the uh, uh, second uh, line therapy if the patient has no recurrence or he was, is not responding. There is a lot of uh, immune uh, therapy, but I'm not going to go through. Now, for the hypertension, again, we have to take into consideration uh, the patient prognosis. Uh, I mean, and, uh, now uh, the uh, PGF uh, hydrazine kinase in his death cause a lot of hypertension, but the patient, we take that into consideration the patient prognosis. If the patient cancer survival is one year, we are not going to treat blood pressure uh, uh, above uh, be, uh, below 150. We may uh, uh, conserve the treatment. But definitely, if the blood pressure is 100, uh, above 160, definitely we need treatment. However, if the patient is low risk and high uh, survival rate for different uh, cancer, we can treat a little bit earlier. And the treatment is with ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and try to avoid diuretics. Now, for the anticoagulation, uh, there is a lot of things uh, that may induce atrial fibrillation in the cancer patient. And then we, we can go with the same thing, with the SHADS, fast, fast score, but I'll add two other things. There's the bleeding risk for this cancer. We go with this uh, parameter, TBIP, uh, bleeding risk, and the interaction, drug-drug interaction, and then the patient preference. So if the patient is very high risk for bleeding, there is no anticoagulation. And as an interventional cardiologist, if the patient receives intervention and the platelet count is below 10,000, no aspirin. Platelet count below uh, 30,000, no PCY2 inhibitor. Uh, if the patient still requires high, uh, uh, high risk, uh, he's high risk for thrombosis, like he has mechanical valve or uh, other thing, we may give warfarin, and the other thing, uh, using DOAX or a low molecular weight heparin depends on the case and the patient preference. The QTC, the, a lot of medication causes QTC, and uh, especially if the patient receiving antibiotics, anti-emetic, so there is uh, this diagram, uh, just the main thing is to stop and see the response. If the QT return to normal or partially to normal, then we can restart the medication. Now, we have to assess the patient at 12 months, and that's really uh, uh, important, especially if the patient develop, uh, are considered high risk, whether they receive high dose of doxorubicin, they will receive radiation, or develop high risk heart failure during the uh, uh, treatment. And uh, uh, with, with that, uh, 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 we can decide whether to continue the heart failure therapy or uh, to stop it. Now, for the long-term follow-up, it's very important, and we can divide that with the patient now is adult, but he survived a childhood cancer, or he is an adult and survived an adult cancer. And whether he's low risk, he'll get annual assessment. He's moderate risk, will get more frequent and high risk. And But in most of the cases, we need to continue heart failure therapy unless they have full recovery and follow-up and still class 2B to taper the heart failure uh, medication. So there, there are also in the guidelines special population about cardiac masses, carcinary valve disease, cardiac amyloidosis, and pregnant women who uh, get diagnosis of cancer and receive anthracycline and the other hit of pregnancy. And uh, there are some guidelines for implantable cardiac fibrillator or uh, the pacemaker, especially if they're getting radiation in the area and whether they are pacemaker dependent or not. Now, this is the summary. There are 57% uh, class 1 indication, 28% class 2A indication. That's 85%. Uh, that's mean you can give, give you the way how to treat the patient. 85%, that's good. But unfortunately, 75% of that are evidence C. So this is the area of medicine that's lacking evidence and screaming for more research and more evidence. And with that, that's the, the reason some people refuse to participate in this guideline. You see, there is one lady which called the queen of cardiology 
in the US and her name is Bonnie Kay and she's the editor of Chief of Cardio Oncology Jack Oncology. She refused to participate in that because still there is no evidence. We need to get more information and get more decision for every patient. And with that, I need to mention something new about permissive cardiotoxicity. That's the only thing. If the patient preference to get more uh, survivor or get the living of the cancer, can we accept my degree of heart damage in order to continue the cancer therapy? And that's the new thing that we need to think about it. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much.